All right, so we left off talking about infrared, and I think we left off right here. We left off talking about the wave number and how <clears throat> the higher the wave number is, the, the more energy it takes <coughs> to match the frequency of the bond. We already talked, we talked about that <clears throat> in infrared. The only way you get a response from a functional group is if the frequency of the radiation ma matches the frequency of the bond as the uh, of the bond, right? So on the left side, left side over here, we're talking about CH sigma bonds, and you can see that as you go from sp three to sp two to sp, that bond is getting shorter and stronger because carbon is becoming more electronegative. On the other side, you can see the same thing. These two carbons are sp3 hybridized. You can see it only takes about uh, the, the uh, wave number is 1200. So that's way down <clears throat> compared to 2200 for a triple bond. And you can see for the triple bond, the reason why that it takes more energy is because that triple bond, both of those carbons are sp hybridized and they're pulling on each other's nucleus because of their electronegativity, <laughs> excuse me, <laughs> electronegativity. So it costs more energy to get that to stretch. You can't twist it because it's linear, uh, but it would, you can get it to stretch back and forth, kind of like uh, two atoms on a spring, but it's, it's gonna cost some energy because of that uh, hybridization state. All right, <clears throat> so let me give you this is the meat of the discussion right here. And it's just different functional groups. And these are some, when I say common, these are ones you need to, you should know, not just for the class, but period. If you ever see infrared anywhere else, like on a standardized exam or something like that, then these are some functional groups that every student who's taking organic is expected to know, right? So uh, the alcohol stretch is here. It's a broad stretch between 32 and 3,400. <clears throat> it's always a big lump like that. It all it, it never looks any other way. Maybe if it's a different, if it's FTIR, it may be a little uh, more sharp, but it's always in that same region. And you can tell it right away because it's a, it's a uh, normally a very broad uh, absorbance. All right, so that's one, that's, one functional group that every student who takes organic should know. All right, another one is here, the carbonyl functional group. <clears throat> and that's this stretch right here. It is a, uh, <laughs> a sharp stretch, strong stretch. And there are many different carbonyl groups, as you can imagine, ketones, aldehydes, esters, uh, I mean, amides, you can go down the list. They all show up in the same region. And so that I have that region kind of listed here, right? So aldehyde 1740 to 1690. Uh, so if you just remember 1600 to 1700 for carbonyls, mm -hmm. then it can be any of these carbonyls, right? But the range is what's important. So a C double bond O stretch is somewhere between 16 and 1700. This is one of the reasons why infrared is not definitive, right? Same with, with mass spec, it's not definitive. You need some, you can't determine a structure using infrared because you don't know what's connected to what. You just know what's there. You might, it, it might show alcohol and a carbonyl and an alkyl. It might show all of that, but you don't know how it's put together. The only way to know how it's put together is with NMR, right? So that's why you can't just use infrared or you can't just use mass spec. You have to combine the methods in order to prove that you've made what you say you made. All right, so aldehydes is 1740 to 1690. Uh, go ahead, Tia. Can you repeat that one more time? What For the people said, in the back. About why... Um, <clears throat> why you can't use it by itself? Yeah, it's like not definitive. Yeah, it, yeah, it's not definitive because you don't know the connectivity. All you know is what's there. It's like... If you uh, are outside a house and you see five cars, you can say, oh, there are five people inside. But when you get inside, it may be 10 people 
And if you're outside, you don't know where they're sitting. You don't know who's eating, who's in the bathroom. You just know some people there, right? It's the same thing with infrared. You know what the functional groups are present, but you don't know how they're connected. There's no way to tell what's bonded to what, what's connected to what. And so that's why it's not definitive. It's only used to confirm the presence of certain functional groups. Like, because here's the, the, uh, the thing is, <clears throat> when you do a synthesis, you, you can kind of ascertain from what we've done already. You have an idea of what you're trying to make, right? You say, I'm doing a lilic bromination on this compound and I'm predicting this as the product, you know what you should get but you have to prove it. So the way you prove it is to analyze it with these different techniques. <laughs> so if you do a lilic bromination on a, on a, add a molecule and you do a mass spec and you don't see a, a, a peak at 79, then it's possible that there's no bromine there. So then if you do infrared and you see, uh, you don't see the double bond, or you don't see a, a, a carbon halogen stretch or whatever, then again, it's possible that you do you don't have what you say, or if you do the NMR and you don't see a certain uh, set of protons in a certain area, same thing. All of these methods are used to confirm uh, what you made. So infrared, it can tell you what's there, but it can't tell you how it's put together. That's the that's the bottom line. So that's why you need another method. So that's why NMR is so important. Thank you. Hmm? Right, so let me let, let let's move on to some other stretches. So nitriles and aromatics. <clears throat> the aromatic stretch is usually very weak. Uh, you see that little absorbance at thirty one forty. It shows up between three thousand and thirty three hundred, so it can show up anywhere in that area, uh, depending on what's attached to it. And it's normally a really weak uh, stretch. And and keep in mind, what's shown on the spectrum. I'm calling them stretches, but really, we talked on uh, Wednesday that there, there are many different types of molecular motion, right? Stretching, bending, wagging, uh, twisting, and so what you see on the with, with that absorbance, it may be um, the result of a stretch, or it may be the result of some other molecular motion. It just depends on what the uh, functional group is. Uh, for the aromatic ring, you can think about the hydrogens that are attached like put together with springs. And so those little hydrogens are just stretching back and forth away from the carbon in the ring. Go ahead, Tia. Okay, I have a question about the nitrile. Mm -hmm. So oh. the, okay. So the frequency, is that is that determined by the, what is the molecular motion or the triple bond? The triple bond. Right, so that particular wave number is, it corresponds to what it takes to get that triple bond. In this case, it is called, we're calling it stretching because we're talking about the nitrile, <coughs> excuse me, the carbon and the nitrogen stretching apart like two atoms on a spring, right? So that is a measure of the energy it takes to get that to happen or to get that to intensify because it's already happening. But when you hit it with this particular wavelength, of infrared uh, radiation, it intensifies that stretch. So that's the absorbance. So that's where you see the absorbance. Because remember when we talked first talk, started talking about this, we said that the only time you see an, uh, an, an, uh, a stretch or a molecular motion intensified is if the radiation that is bombarded with matches the frequency that it's already stretching it. So it's it's a it's a consequence of the fact that it's an sp carbon uh triple bonded to nitrogen that that's why it takes so much energy but what you're seeing is that the stretching that's already happening once that matches that wavelength then it's going to intensify so that's when you see the absorbance and you can see it's a medium absorbance very sharp and that's always indicative of the nitrile 2260 uh, somewhere between 2000 and 2300. So that's what that's going to show up. So what you're looking for in infrared is a couple of things. You're looking for the location, number one, because everything has a range, but you're also looking at the intensity. If it's a medium stretch or a weak stretch or a broad stretch or a strong stretch. So those things kind of go together to tell you that it's a nitrile or it's aromatic or it's alkyl. 
Mm -hmm. It's like right here, <clears throat> the Al Key stretch is about between 14 and 1600, but it's, it's a really, it's not a very strong stretch. It's considered a medium stretch, but it's not, you know, that can easily overlap with other stretches. So that's again, why <clears throat> you can't just use this by itself. Because that Al Key stretch can overlap or other stuff can overlap and cover it up and you can't see it. So you can't just say here, here's an infrared. I know I made this because some of the stretches overlap. They get covered up by stretches or, or absorbances that show up in the same area. So once again, you got to use a different method. All right, so here we have an ether stretch, very pronounced, oh, very pronounced stretch between 1,000 and 1,200. It's the CO single bond stretch. So it's the that's the absorbance between 1,000 and 1,200, and that's where that bond frequency, the stretching frequency, matches the energy that's it, that is being bombarded with. And so this is a common stretch. Notice it's a very strong stretch. And it always it's got that characteristic um, absorbance between 1,000 and uh, 1,200. Now, one of the stretches that I didn't show on here, that I didn't talk about, but I can point it out here, is right here, right? So this is the alkyl stretch. So normally, if you have carbon-carbon, uh, single bonds, like chain, you have alkyl chains anywhere in your molecule, uh, you're gonna see that alkyl stretch somewhere between 2,800 and 3,000. And it's always raggedy and jagged looking like that. So that's how that's an easy way to tell an alkyl stretch. And this is this infrared is for diethyl ether. So it's, there's a CH2, CH3 on each side of that oxygen, right? So that, that ethyl group is the alkyl group that's going that's showing up right here, all right. And these are just a, this is just a list of the common stretching frequencies. And this PowerPoint is on uh, Blackboard, so I'm not going to go through each one of these. But uh, you can see also there's some other molecular motions in here that show up in other places, right? So CH bending, CC bending. Uh, you can see like. The other molecular motions that are also captured, but they don't all show up at the same place. Right. Most of these are stretching frequencies. So what it takes to take two atoms and pull them apart and let them come back together. <clears throat> all right. So this is a an example right here of uh, just a, a simple alcohol. And you can see down at 3350, you see that broad hump. That's the OH stretch. You see the alkyl stretch at 2980. That is indicative of the chain that's right here. And then you also see that CO single bond stretch down here at 1100. All right. So that's that's the, the, the these, this infrared again tells us about the alcohol here. But again, we don't know the connectivity. We don't know <laughs> that is primary. I'm showing you that it's primary, but we don't know that based on this by itself. An NMR will prove that it was primary because if it was, if the OH was anywhere else on the chain, it would show up. You could, you could tell the connectivity from the NMR. You could tell what's connected to what, which carbons are adjacent to one another and things like that. So we're gonna talk, we're gonna actually start uh, NMR uh, shortly. I just wanna go through a couple more of these examples. All right, so this is, cyclohexanone and again you see uh 2990 you see alkyl uh stretching for the ring right you see the ketone stretch at 1680 very strong stretch and then at 1620 you see the alkyl stretch and again you see it's covered up right it's actually overlapping with the ketone because they're both pi systems and they're both going to have a similar uh, stretching vi uh, vibration. The frequency is going to be a little bit different for the carbonyl because of that dipole. But you can see that they're laying right on top of each other, right? And so again, you can't if I if I just showed you the, the spectrum, you could pick out the functional groups and say this, this, and this, but you don't know. You have no idea how the molecule is constructed. So the, the only way to do that 
is through NMR. All right, this is a <clears throat> this is the chow cone. Are y'all working with chow cones this semester in Organic Two Lab? Oh, yeah. Yeah. So this is what the what the infrared looks like for diphenyl uh, chow cone. Right. And as you can imagine, you got a bunch of stuff. For you got aromatics. You got a, a, a conjugated. The whole system is conjugated, but you have a conjugated uh, ketone right here, alpha beta unsaturated ketone. You have aromatics, so you're going to see a lot of different stretches in here, right? You can see the aromatic, that little weak stretch right there. If you <clears throat> didn't know, you would dismiss it. And you got two aromatic rings here, right? But that's the aromatic uh, CH stretching. And then at 1700, you have the ketone stretch. And then 1780, <laughs> you have a possible isomer where the double bond right here, instead of it being trans, it sits. So whether this phenyl ring will be pointed up that way. Uh, so you got the other isomer in there, possibly, and you have your aromatic CA stretching. And so this is, again, this is why it's important to couple these methods. You don't just do one method. You have to do other methods to find out um, what the actual compounds look like, like what the connectivity is. Because if you just looked at this, you wouldn't know. You wouldn't know what it was. You might you might pick out, say, oh, that's, that has to have an aromatic in it, or it has to have a ketone in it. Uh, but I don't, or it has to have an alkene in it, which is showing up at 1660, right alongside the ketone stretch. But we don't, you wouldn't know how it's built, right? So that's why you can't just do this by itself. So this is an example right here. This is phenacetin. This is the precursor to uh, acetaminophen. <clears throat> and you can see you have aromatic stretching uh, covered up by the alcohol and the amine. You can see, well, the amide, not the amine. The amide stretch is right here, 3,400. The alcohol is here at 3,200. And then at 1650, you have your amide stretch. Uh, and then you have 1480 and 1550 showing up. These, this, these are aromatic stretches. This is bend, these are aromatic uh, bending stretches or aromatic bending, not stretching. But that's a different molecular motion that's being picked up at those lower uh, wavelengths. All right, so infrared is, is a great tool. It's indispensable to the organic chemist, but you have to have another tool in order to, to confirm a structure. Right. You can't just say I made something and have no way to prove it. So you got to be able to prove it. All right. And the way we prove that is through NMR. And so let me. Any questions about what we just talked about before we move on? Um, I have a question. Go ahead. Okay. Go back. Mm -hmm. um, to this slide or the one before or the what? Third to last slide. Right here? The one after that. Yeah, that one. Mm -hmm. um, I think you mentioned an overlap. Yes. Um, right here. So this is the alkene, which is right here at 1620. And then this is 1680 as the ketone. OK, so OK, just by looking at it, how are you able to tell that that's an overlap and not one? Experience. <laughs> you just, I mean, you just have to, first you have to know like what the stretches are. And then the other part is, cause you know, the alkene can be from 14 to 1600. There's always a little bit of play in there uh, as far as like, if it's 1620 or 1610 or 1605, that's always some play in there depending on what the molecule is. Uh, but that just comes with experience and reading reading infrared spectrum. That's a great question. But but again, you see, again, this is why we can't just use this. We got to use something else along with it. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, so let's jump in. And thankfully, uh, we have an NMR, and many of you already have experience working with it. Uh, so a lot of the theory part we have already learned. We learned that in um, Organic One Lab, to be, uh, to be honest. So 
let me just recap what NMR tells us. Right, NMR tells us, <coughs> excuse me, NMR tells us three things. And these are the three important things that we're gonna learn from, from this section. Number one, we're gonna learn about the number of signals, right? The, the number of signals is gonna tell us how many different types of hydrogens are present. Right, the, uh, when we say different types, the, the term for that is uh, non-equivalent. So how many sets or types of non-equivalent hydrogens are present? The other, other thing, important thing that we wanna take from NMR is where are they located? So are they in electron rich environments or electron poor environments? And then the third part is the connectivity. And we tell the connectivity by the splitting pattern, like how the lines are split. So it can be a singlet, it can be a doublet, a triplet, so on and so forth, right? The, the, there's a fourth thing too, and it's also important, but the number of signals, the location and the splitting is a little bit more important than the fourth thing, which is how many. Like each signal represents a certain number of protons. So each signal is gonna be uh, this is the this is what we call integration, right? We we integrate the signal, take the area under the curve, and each signal is going to re be representative of one of these protons. So let let's start there. So we got one, two, three, four, five signals. What that tells me is that for this molecule, there are five different types of hydrogens, right? And if we look at the molecule, we got a CH a hydrogen here. We have uh, two hydrogens here. Go ahead, Tia. Um, what are what are you what are you showing us? Is it the dot? The PowerPoint? Oh, is it not showing up? No, I see the PowerPoint, but is this what you're showing us? Yeah. Oh, okay. Sorry. Do you see that now? Two blue oh. arrows in the bottom. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, we see that now. Okay, okay, okay. All right. I should have done a new share instead of just switch, switching PowerPoints. Yeah, so so we got five signals in here, right? And because of that, that means there are five different types of hydrogen. So you got to, uh, and this is, let me let me back up because I jumped in. It, this, what we're going to be talking about is proton NMR. So the nucleus that we're studying uh, is the hydrogen nucleus. We're not looking at another nucleus because um, there are other types of nuclei you can study. You can study fluorine, uh, you can study oxygen NMR, carbon NMR, uh, silicon NMR, and lots of different types of nuclei you can study. <clears throat> but we're only going to be looking at proton NMR. So you have hydrogens here, you have two hydrogens here, one here, one here, and one here. Right, so that's, well, not one, but three, three, and one. So this, this is one, two, three, four, five types, because none of them are equivalent to each other. <clears throat> and each one of them has its own signal, and each one has its own splitting pair. Right? All right, so with the uh, spectra, that's what we're able to tell. We're able to tell how many non-equivalent protons are present, where they are. Uh, if they're by something that's electron withdrawing, then it's gonna be more downfield because they're, they're gonna be electron poor. If they're near something that's electron uh, donating, then they're gonna be upfield because that's electron rich. Uh, so yeah, so this is what the NMR allows us to understand. All right, and this is a very powerful tool uh, because again, you you never go in. It's it's on a, it should be on Blackboard. Uh, I'm trying to remember what I, I'll I'll let you know what folder is in uh, afterwards, but it's on it's there. Um, and if not, I'll post it in the course notes um today when I post the recording and stuff. All right, so we got. Uh, lost my train of thought. 
Electron rich upfield, further closer to zero. Electron poor downfield, further away from zero. And then if you notice, none of the uh, signals are just a single line. They're all like these are singlets, these three, but everything else is split. That split and that split. You can see that um, this is actually split into four lines, right? So there's a reason for that. All everything that you see in the NMR has a reason why you see it, right? So we've talked about the theory before. It's nuclear magnetic resonance. Uh, you can study any, well, not any, but there are many different types of nuclei that you can study. But NMR, you're studying a nu the nucleus of a particular atom within a molecule, and that atom has a pre-existing uh, magnetic field that you're going to manipulate. So that's what the big can is with the magnet and the liquid hydrogen and the liquid uh, helium, I'm sorry, liquid nitrogen and liquid helium to keep the magnet cold because that magnet is going to be what you use to manipulate the magnetic field around whatever nucleus you're studying. And what it tells us is the, the framework, carbon hydrogen framework of a molecule. So it tells us the connectivity, how it's built, how it's put together. Uh, the range is from zero to 10 parts per million. And your chemical shift data is calibrated. You should, you should remember this from when we did this with aspirin uh, from TMS, trimethylsilane. So that TMS is all of your NMR solvents are doped up with TMS, maybe a lot, maybe a little bit. Uh, but that TMS always shows up at zero. So you can calibrate your spectra based on TMS. All right, so you've seen the, the magnet already. So we're not really talk about that. Uh, but you know, and, and you've seen the sample prep where you just take a sample. If it's a solid, dissolve it up in a deuterated solvent and put the tube in the magnet and the, the tube, the sample gets pulsed with radio frequency energy. And while it's getting pulsed, it's altering the magnetic field, the spins around the, around the nucleus. And when those spins relax, They give off uh, energy and that energy gets picked up by a detector and that's how you get a, a spectrum, right? So you have a random, your, your spins are random. You put the sample into the magnetic field and the spins line up with it or against it and then you just pulse it. And the ones that are against the field line up and go into resonance. And then as they relax back between pulses, you pick that energy up and it's, it's detected by a detector and you can, uh, generate a spectrum from that, right? So every time it lines up and goes back, it gives off energy. And so that's in between pulses. If you remember, when we were doing aspirin, uh, there was 16 pulses, and there was about a second and a half between every pulse or somewhere in there, maybe two seconds, right? So every time it pulses, it forces those out of line uh, or misaligned uh, spins to line up, but the minute the pulse stops, the, those spins go back to their normal state where they were, which was anti-parallel to the, to the field. All right. So this is the, on the left side, <clears throat> what we call an FID. And uh, that's what we call free induction decay. And on the right side is the actual spectrum. And so we have to convert that and we convert it using what's called a Fourier transform. It's not something that you do uh, manually. <coughs> it's programmed into the, soft, the NMR software. So you go from the left, you uh, type in a command FT and you get the NMR that's generated on the right. So we're gonna look at a, a real simple example. If you watched the video that I sent, you might've already seen this or should have already seen it. But in this example, we're going to look at uh, ethyl acetate. And the first thing we want to look at is what is equivalent, what's non-equivalent, and how do we tell, right? So if you notice, there are three signals in this NMR, right? And if you notice up here, I have them highlighted or color-coded, there are three different types of protons in the molecule. So what that means is that there are three 
types or three sets. I like to call them sets, three sets of non-equivalent protons. Now let, let's cl clarify something. The three hydrogens that are right here, they are equivalent to each other, right? So they're not gonna each give separate signals. They're gonna give one signal, right? But they're not equivalent to the three over here because it's, there's no symmetry. If it was symmetrical, then you could say that. But since there's no symmetry, everything is gonna be non-equivalent. So that's what you're really looking for. Unless there's some symmetry in a molecule or even in a functional group, like an isopropyl group, something like that, you're not gonna see uh, equivalent signals. Everything is gonna be non-equivalent if, if, if the molecule is not symmetrical. All right, so you look right here, you got one, two, three, different types and you got one, two, three signals, right? So none of those are, all of those are what we consider non-equivalent, all right? So that, that means you're gonna get three signals. Every set of non-equivalent protons is gonna give its own signal and it's gonna have its own intensity. It might be uh, tall or shorter and the intensity is always based on the number of protons that signal represents. All right, so you got three types, so you're going to get three signals. The way you test for, uh, and I, I'm not going to use this slide because it's, it's good for definitions, but I don't like the, uh, the example. So let's talk about what the, the terms, homotopic, that means that those are equivalent. Heterotopic means non-equivalent. So if we go back here, the three hydrogens on this carbon are homotopic. They're equivalent to each other but they are heterotopic with respect to these hydrogens and these hydrogens, right? So the, the, together on the carbon, they're homotopic, but when you compare them to the other two, they are heterotopic. Same here, these two are homotopic with each other, but they're heterotopic compared to the other two sets. And the same thing here. So that's how we know what homotopic, what's heterotopic, what's equivalent, what's non-equivalent. So we got three homotopic, I'm, I'm sorry, three heterotopic mm -hmm. proton sets. And so all of them are gonna give a different signal. All right, the way you can test for that is very simple. If you wanna compare the blue and the pink protons, what you would do is take off one of the blue protons and put another atom in its place, like a chlorine. And if you do that, then compare it. Then you do the same thing here. Take one of these off and put another atom in its place and compare the two compounds that you get. If they're different, then they're not equivalent. If they're the same, then they're equivalent. All right? So that's how we test for, um, that's how we test for equivalence. We can just pull off a pro, if you, any two protons, <laughs> that you want to know uh, whether or not they're homotopic or heterotopic, you just pull one off and put another atom in. And then the other set that you're wondering about, you pull one of those off and put another atom and you compare the two structures. And if you get two different things, then you know that they are heterotopic. Mm -hmm. All right. All right, so let's look at this these three molecules here. All right, you got one, two, three carbons. And on each carbon, you have protons that are present, two protons here, and three here and three here. So again, this is, none of these are equivalent. There, there's no symmetry. And so if there's no symmetry, you're gonna, all of those are gonna be non-equivalent. Same thing here, right? There's no symmetry here. And so everything here is non-equivalent. So you're gonna see seven different signals for this molecule. Right, one, two, the, the one proton here that's attached to oxygen, three, four, five, six, seven. All of these are gonna be non-equivalent. The way you tell them apart in the spectrum is where they're located, where they're located and they're splitting pattern. So that's why, again, the number of non-equivalent protons is important, the location is important, and the splitting pattern is important. All right, same thing here. You have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven sets of protons. 
So let me go to the spectra for those. Right, so this is the this is the spectrum for this uh, molecule right here. Right, you can see this has some complex, really complex splitting patterns uh, for some of these protons. Right, uh, the protons here, these are and again location. These are alkene protons. These are going to be down here. Right, the protons. The proton here next to chlorine, that's the proton showing up at 3.5, right? And then over here, this set of protons at 1.57, that's here. But then you also have a set of protons here at 2.33 and 2.08. So that's, that's down here in this region. And you can see that it's crazy. It looks crazy. And there's a reason why it looks crazy. And that's because it's adjacent to a alkene and also adjacent to a chlorine, which could or could not be a chiral center. Uh, so that's why you see that complex splitting. And we'll we'll come back to that because what you what you see is is this is what we call complex splitting. You can see that these are really strange looking uh, signals, and you notice all, they're all the same height, right? There, there's a difference between a signal that's split into a quartet and a signal that's split into what we call a doublet of doublets. So we'll talk about that later. <laughs> All right, so now let's talk about the multiplicity, right? We got about there, we got a few minutes left. So the multiplicity or the splitting pattern is how each signal is split, right? You see, this is a single line. You see right here, that's three lines. And then you see right here, that's four lines, right? And again, they're color coded. So the pink protons are here, split into four lines, which we call a quartet. The blue protons are here, split into uh, three lines, which we call a triplet. And then the red protons are here, split, and there's no splitting, and it, we call that a singlet. So there's a reason for that. And the way we determine that, is what, using what we call the N plus one rule. So that none of these are single lines except for one, right? And the, there's a reason why that happens, right? So we follow what's called the N plus one rule for multiplicity. So whatever, if this set of uh, protons right here, let's say the, the pink set, we look at what's neighboring those protons. And again, this helps us to, to, to determine the connectivity. It helps us to find out what's bound to what, what's next to what. Uh, so with the N plus one rule, we take the number of neighboring protons. So this is the pro set of protons that we're looking at. We're looking at what's to the left and what's to the right. And we're looking to see if um, the, the number of protons that are to the left and to the right. So let's look at it. Right, so you see right here, this is a, let's, look, let's do the pink set. This is a quart, uh, quartet. There are four lines in this signal. If you notice, <clears throat> the two middle lines are, are taller than the two outside lines, right? There's a reason for that. Um, and then, so how do we know that that's a quartet? Well, if we look at the neighboring protons and apply the N plus one rule, there are three protons here, there are none here. And so the, the uh, splitting pattern should be N plus one, which is three. I mean, I'm sorry, which is uh, three plus one, which is four. All right, let me pull that up. All right, so it's the three blue protons that are splitting with this. So that's why it shows up as a quartet because it has three neighbors. So that's N and then plus one, which will give me four. The same thing here, the CH3 out here, <clears throat> there are no protons on the carbon next door to it, right? And so because of that, the, uh, the N is zero and N plus one is one. So it's a singlet. Go ahead, Tia. Uh, I'm confused. Um, when, when you say, Neighbor, like mm -hmm. 
multiple times. Like, what do you mean? Um, if I'm looking at this set, the neighbors are adjacent on the carbon, the atom to the left and the atom to the right. So this, there are no hydrogens here neighboring this, but here it has three hydrogens neighboring it. So N for this set of protons, N is equal to three. So when I apply the N plus one rule, that's going to tell, that's telling me that the signal for that set of protons is going to be N plus one number of lines. So that means it's going to be three N, which is the number of neighbors, is three plus one. So that signal is going to be split into four lines, which it is. If you see right here, there's one, two, three, four lines for this signal. So that's how that's how we determine the multiplicity or the splitting pattern. <laughs> Every proton, if it's near other protons, is going to experience their magnetic field. And so that's what causes that multiplicity. So over here, this is experiencing the magnetic fields of these three protons here. So and it, the, the number of neighbors is three and the splitting pattern is gonna be four. Same thing for this one. There are no hydrogens on this carbon next door, right? So N in this case is gonna be zero. So N is zero, zero plus one is one. So this signal is gonna be a singlet, right? And then by the same token for the blue protons, uh, the hydrogens are here that we're looking at. Next door to those hydrogens, you have two protons, right? So this is going to be N for this set is going to be two, which is right here, plus one. That should be a three, right? That's a typo. Uh, let me, I can fix that. Oh, let me make that, in. that should be three lines. And it is a, come on, PowerPoint. It's a triplet. All right. So the N plus one rule applies for all protons. If it's if it has five hydrogens next door, then N is five, and it's going to be split into six lines. If it's got six hydrogens next door, it's going to be split into seven lines. All you're looking for is what is adjacent to the protons that you that you're looking at. So if I'm looking at this set of protons. And I'm trying to figure out which signal represents that. I can look at the carbon next door and say, oh, there are two hydrogens here. So that signal has to be a triplet. Because if I apply the N plus one rule, it is two plus one. So two neighbors plus one. So that's going to give me a triplet. Right? Did that answer your question or no? Uh, yeah, I did. All right. So this is the reason why you see the pattern you see is right here. It's this Pascal's triangle. So if it's, if it's a doublet, you're going to get uh, two lines that are equal in value. If it's a triplet, the uh, central line is going to be higher than the two out, outer lines. And you can see that right here. You see how the, the central line here is high. And that's all symmetrical. So this is higher than the two outside lines. But the quartet is the same thing, right? The, the two inner lines are higher than the two outside lines. And what that what that's telling me <laughs> is that for the, let's say for a triplet, right? Remember, these are like the signals are the result of the magnetic field around the uh, uh, nucleus. And so what this is like for the triplet, for instance, what that's saying is that these are the different ways that the magnetic field can be aligned for that particular nucleus, right? It's both can be with the field, both can be against the field, but then you also have a situation where one can be with and, and one can be against, and you can have the opposite of that. So that's why those two, that central line is higher than the two outside lines because of that, because of the way the magnetic fields can be oriented, right? So, any, so when you see a triplet, that's what that central line means. This is both lining up uh, one against and one with, but since there are two protons, then they have the, they both have the ability to do that, right? And the same thing with the outside line. So that's why you see those, sig if, when those signals aren't symmetrical, that's, a, that's also indicative of something else, right? If it's like, let me go back to here. 
you can see this, let's say this signal right here. It's got one, two, three, four, five, six lines, but it's not, if you notice, it's not symmetrical at all the same height. And there's a reason for that. that that's because it, even though it's still following the N plus one rule, there's another phenomenon at work, uh, which we're gonna talk about later called multiple non-equivalence. So that's why you see, you, you say, oh, that's six lines is a sextet, but it's not. If it was a sextet, the six lines would be oriented differently. You have two outer lines that are short, then two inner lines that are a little bit taller, and then two inner lines that are taller than the other four. But here you don't see that. So that's how that these are just simple splitting patterns that follow uh, Pascal's rule. But if you have complex splitting, then it's a little different. All right, questions about the splitting. We want to do some examples to, to walk us through this too. This is all just to get our, get the foundation laid. Oh, it's 9.52. All right, I'm going to stop here. We're going to pick this up on Monday and 